This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At our monthly military history night on October the 9th, Dr. Ken Hedges told the epic story of the British Transarctic Expedition of 1968-69 from Point Barrow, Alaska to the Svalbard Islands across open sea ice. Dr. Hedges was a member of the expedition. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, a warm welcome and Ken, the floor is yours. Good evening. Oh, I see some young faces along here in the front row. Um, I know some of you need to leave early tonight, that is before I finish spouting away. And I must tell you a true story. When I was based in Borden at one time, a group of officers from Thailand arrived to join the language course. And I was entertaining them on their first night. And there was a colonel there who spoke absolutely no English at all. He learned just one word in English uh, before he came. And that was a long flight all the way from Bangkok to Toronto. And in the middle of the, of the evening, as we were sitting around a round table, uh, all drinking beer, he stood up and bowed very politely and uttered his only word that he had learned in English before coming to Canada, toilet. <laughs> so, so if you need to leave in the middle of my spouting away here, you know how to do it. <laughs> well, a thousand years ago, a Viking longship outward bound from Greenland was driven off course during a North Atlantic gale to make landfall upon an unrecognized shore. Oh, I meant to press something, aren't I? Oh, ignore that, that just means I'm broke. <laughs> These Vikings had spanned the Atlantic Ocean and in doing so had sailed from the old world to reach a new world. It was at this point, close to where the Arctic Circle crosses the eastern seaboard of Baffin Island, where the human race, dispersing from their origin eastward and westward in the pre-dawn of recorded history, first encompassed the globe. When North seafarers, over, appearing over the horizon from the direction of the morning sunrise, first interacted with the Inuit hunters whose ancestors had migrated out of the evening sunset across a continental landmass. Then in 1968, in fact just 50 years after the last three islands of the Canadian Arctic were discovered, we were poised to return from the new world to the old world. The British Transarctic Expedition would attempt the first crossing of the surface of the Arctic Ocean, roughly following a great circle route across 11 time zones. Our four-man crossing party would use dog sleds, driving across a bridge of ice spanning the long axis of the Arctic Ocean, reaching from the north shore of Alaska via the geographic North Pole to the distant Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard. There were no maps, only the unpredictable terrain of unstable ice with fractured surfaces and countless pressure ridges and months of darkness as we hunkered down, overwintering in the approaches to the North Pole. There would be measured risks to be taken, an encounter with a rabid fox, and fire, and half rations, and incapacitating injury, and the risk of attrition amongst our dogs, and the unreadable expression of predatory polar bears with the stark confrontation of kill, or be killed. Later there would be time for prolonged isolation to test our mettle 
as we lived and moved across the sea ice on a venture that would extend over 476 days. The journey which lay ahead would not just be a geographical transit, but one of a physically demanding nature with its own psychological challenges. And by virtue of the hazards we might encounter and our remote circumstances, present an existential dimension which would invite a philosophical mindset as we tried to figure out why we were trying to do this in the first place. This is a bird's eye view, the posh term for which is an azimuth projection, a bird's eye view of the North Pole. You'll all recognize the chart. The world's largest ocean, the Pacific Ocean, was first explored, of course, by the Polynesians. Then Magellan, 500 years ago, in his flagship Trinidad, sailing for 99 days, reached the Mariana Islands, during which time his crew, of course, were decimated with scurvy. Yet 14, 450 years later, by 1968, still to be traversed was the impenetrable vastness of the ice-locked Arctic Ocean. Exactly 400 years before we set out, Mercator had produced a map which showed a northern sea route to the Orient. He surrounded the North Pole with four mystical islands populated by pygmies. Were they the medieval equivalent of E.T.? Or was this a geopolitical commentary referring not to their diminutive stature, but to the inferior status of yet to be colonized Aboriginal peoples? Just 27 years before Mercator, in 1492, a date we all know, Columbus had taken 33 days to sail from the Canary Islands to reach the Bahamas. Within 10 years of Columbus, Amerigo Vespucci had established the immensity of a huge continental landmass, which he called Mundus Novus, or New World. His name is captured for posterity. First, it was Latinized to the masculine, Americus, and then, by convention, feminized to America, in keeping with the manner by which all continents are named. Asia, Africa, Europa, and later Australasia, and Antarctica. And within another 10 years, Copernicus computed that the heliocentric movement of the Earth with its rotation around an axis defined by the north and south geographic poles. Now, for the first time, north is no longer simply a direction pointing away from the midday sun, but also a destination, a fixed point on the Earth's surface, the North Pole. Today, the world's seas and oceans are defined by the international hydrographic uh, organization, which has observer status with the United Nations. The Arctic Ocean covers five million square miles, roughly one and a half times the size of the United States. In 1881, shown with a red arrow here, off Henrietta Island, a ship called the Jeannette foundered and sank in the ice. Three years later, her wreckage was found off southwest Greenland, and this was the first clue to the existence of a current crossing the Arctic Ocean, the Transpolar Drift Stream. This is the largest island in the Svalbard archipelago, Spitsbergen. In 1773, just two years after Captain James Cook was killed in Hawaii, the Royal Navy's first expedition specifically tasked with finding a route to the geographic North Pole became trapped in ice. They were held fast by cross currents and pressuring ice swelling around a cluster of seven small offshore islands forming the northernmost extent of the Svalbard archipelago. Excerpts of the log of one of those ships, HMS Carcass, toilet, <laughs> recorded her latitude together with compass bearings of a towering granite cliff giving a distinctive slab-like silhouette to an island called Vesle Tavloya, or Little Table Island. 
The log also records the youngest member of the ship's complement, 14 years old midshipman Horatio Nelson, whose youthful presence was in contravention of Admiralty orders, which is a polite way of saying he lied about his age, guys. Sudden ice movement can cause the frozen ocean to, to break up at any time of year without warning. This is particularly dangerous during darkness or when asleep. Exposed ocean depths can widen or close as flows drift apart or collide like cornflakes stirred on a sea of milk. The most distinctive feature of the frozen ocean presented a major obstacle to progress, reminiscent of the bocage, bocage hedgerow fighting principally confronting the American forces advancing from the Normandy beachhead on D-Day. These ridges, which can advance at a walking pace, would be heralded by a crashing and gouging when raw edges of breaking ice flows would be heaved above or thrust beneath each other as the flow you were standing on would tremble and jar and disintegrate. Faced with this scenario, time was of the essence as we swayed to the rhythm of the seasons. So we'd taken our chances and set out from Point Barrow, Alaska during the 20 hours of darkness in early February of 1968. It would take us three weeks to find a way through the treacherous offshore ice scouring the Alaskan coast. Out at sea, drifting ice has a propensity for becoming a tombstone not only because of what it is, but because of where it is. The sheer kinetic power, penetrating cold, and inescapable isolation created a state of permanent insecurity. We were reminded of the 11 men who had succumbed in this same ice field of the Beaufort Sea during the fateful Canadian Government Arctic Expedition of 1913. As the unstable ice was pulverized in the surrounding darkness by fast offshore currents, the danger became pervasive. There was nowhere to hide, and so we set a watch depending upon our own vigilance and mobility. There is here, I believe, a lesson which is worth passing on. There's a difference between fear in the face of imminent danger and an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. Fear, especially when accompanied by sleep deprivation or hypothermia, or the imposed consequences of confinement in any circumstances, can generate a, de a debilitating uncertainty. It can also be a wake-up call to remain steadfast within the limitations and undetermined time scale of our mortal frame. Fear is in fact our watchdog. It sounds the alarm. It calls for personal resolve and clear-headed decision-making. For as my favorite author, Lord Jonathan Sachs, points out, fear is a mood. It is not a policy. In the event, we would wield our ice axes to carve a route through for our dogs hauling our laden sleds over countless pressure ridges. Detours would almost double our straight line distance. We needed to zigzag in order to make up for lost ground as a result of pressure ridges, blizzards, open water, and the treadmill effect of drifting off course as we were swept for miles by diverting countercurrents. The Sunday Times, the BBC television, book publication rights, and corporate sponsorship funded the expedition. Long-haul military flights in the high Arctic masqueraded as navigational exercises. The Royal Navy's Ice Patrol vessel HMS Endurance steaming all the way from Antarctica to pick up four men and man's best friends would conduct a goodwill visit to a cluster of largely uninhabited Norwegian islands and so the spirit of Nelson lives on. Or as Shakespeare would put it, all the world's a stage. This photograph is taken on the 17th of January 1912. It's one of my favorite photographs actually. And I put on there a quote from Roald Amundsen's logbook. He arrived at the South Pole in a race between himself and Scott of the Antarctic. And when Amundsen got there, 
He wrote, we arrived and were able to plant our flag at the geographical South Pole. God be thanked. Just a few weeks later, when Scott got there, he looked at the tent. This is the Norwegian tent that the British group are looking at. And he wrote in his diary, great God, this is an awful place and worse still without the reward of priority. Incredible to me, isn't it? That there they were at the same place at the same time with such different frames of mind. At the Cavalry and Guards Club of Piccadilly in London, there hangs a picture. It's entitled A Very Gallant Gentleman and it's a painting of Lieutenant Titus Oates of the Royal Inniskilling Dragoon Guards who was a member of Scott's party. He had badly frostbitten feet and he was slowing down the rest of the group. And he said, as recorded in Scott's diary, I'm going outside and I may be away for some time. The example presented by this young officer, painfully struggling on severely frostbitten feet into the punishing cold, served as a role model for the generation of young men, later polar explorers and mountaineers in their own right. All had been called to the colors during World War II and now served on the Royal Geographical Society's British Transarctic Expedition Committee in London under the patronage of His Royal Highness Prince Philip. Our crossing party, our four-man crossing party, was the smallest number consistent with a capacity for self-help. Interpersonal difficulties had been encountered during the previous year's workup in the Eastern Arctic and had resulted in the unexpected resignation of one team member. At short notice, the Ministry of Defense were approached to provide a replacement from a list of candidates uh, for whom the Department of Defense had no further use, selected from the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Royal Marines. Teamwork, the reciprocal lifeblood of leadership and loyalty, would set the pace. Training, or in its absence, an informal process of learning by osmosis, would elevate the newcomer's trial and error to a toughened response to any given situation. We all expected to survive, recognizing, however, that survival was at best a temporary reprieve from the inevitability of mortal life. And so we set out to complete the first crossing of the last of the world's five oceans. And in the event, were to pull it off only seven weeks before mankind landed on the sea of tranquility following their 11-day round trip to the moon. As things turned out, our crossing party were to meet as a team only one week before we reached our start line in Alaska. So much for pre-mission training. It was more like a cross between a blind date and an arranged marriage. And guess who was the virgin? The next slide, please. Wally Herbert's the leader of the expedition. He had conceived a five-phase plan. There would be three traveling se uh, seasons during which we would need to progress 20 kilometers a day across pack ice in constant motion. And there would be two drifting periods in the summer when the ice wouldn't freeze and in the winter when it was dark for 24 hours a day. The next slide shows Fritz Kerner. At the time of our expedition, the average thickness of a multi-year ice flow was three and a half meters. And of course, the ice cover extended all the way from the North Shore of Alaska to our final target of Svalbard. Climatologists had no inkling of any likelihood of an approaching pattern of global warming. We had only a general understanding that the Arctic was fragile and that a mere two degrees Celsius rise in average global temperature stood between our success and failure. Kerner undertook a program of manual measurements of sea ice thickness. And 35 years later, in 2002, these were to provide a basis for calibrating the first satellite determination of sea ice thickness. His work also established baseline data against which later observations would confirm early indications of the impact of climate change. The ice was melting. We needed a 15 centimeter, roughly six inch thickness of newly formed salt water ice to bear the weight of our sleds. 
Crossing newly formed sea ice is unnerving. It both looks and feels as if you're walking on a trampoline. And the best technique when traversing thin ice is to follow behind somebody else. <laughs> I fell through the ice once. The temperature that day was minus 53 degrees Celsius. The outstretched arms of my wolfskin parka instantly froze to the ice surface providing a purchase to haul myself clear. Kerner also observed the albedo effect of solar radiation, measuring 40% glare off open seawater, which all sailors are familiar with, and double that and 80% glare off snow. And this exposure to solar radiation carries the risk of snow blindness with the potential for delayed cataract formation and skin cancer. Conversely, any loss of reflection from sea ice accelerates climate warming. Alan Gill was our navigator and cameraman for the BBC documentary Across the Top of the World, which is now available on YouTube. So if any of you want to leave right now, just remember <laughs> Across the Top of the World on YouTube. Note the irregular silhouette of broken ice on the horizon. Theodolite replaces the sextant. The sextant uses a horizontal datum line. The theodolite uses a vertical effect of gravity in place of the visual horizon to measure celestial angles. Navigational precision would be to within, within about 200 meters. But you might drift that distance in any direction within the time it took you to calculate your position. So accuracy was limited to about 400 meters, say a quarter of a mile. Alan Gill kept an impeccable record of navigational observations, firstly to establish our position, then correcting for magnetic variation, then forming the basis for course corrections to offset drift, and giving a position fix for extreme range parachute drops, and providing an unbroken dotted line as documentary evidence of our journey. Each man was equipped with a sled hauled by a team of 10 West Greenland Inuit sled dogs. These wonderful creatures are powerful animals with the endurance necessary to cover vast distances and able to thrive in extreme cold weather for months on end. Unlike their Alaskan counterparts, the Greenland dogs were accustomed to work individually using a fan hitch to reduce the loss of momentum when negotiating moving ice and the rough terrain of countless pressure ridges. In the pristine beauty and immense silence of the Arctic stillness, it was the mute constancy of our dogs, our beasts of burden, which shared and at times best conveyed the inspiring testimony of creation. Out here, it is the gaze of animal life which reflects the conscience of mankind in the stewardship of nature. There were dog fights. The animals have a strong pack instinct with a powerful hierarchy. And we lost six dogs in dog fights, giving us a 15% rate of attrition. They were, of course, a last resort of food in a survival setting. And it's of interesting to note that Amundsen set out with 52 dogs. He returned with 11. In a calculated expenditure by which weaker animals were sacrificed to feed stronger dogs. Unlike the Inuit, we were in transit. We were stepping from our noisy culture, dominated by the linear art of time management, into a world close to nature which had never lost the art of waiting for nature to take its course. And so we swayed to the Inuit drumbeat of cyclical time, imaga akago, tomorrow perhaps pacing ourselves according to nature's recurring dictates of prevailing weather and ice conditions and the polar seasons. It was not our intent to revert to a primitive lifestyle for its own sake, but to benefit from the aboriginal wisdom of inhabitants who's, who had thrived at one extreme of the 100 degrees Celsius range of climate within which mankind can live. There, 
it's lovely to see some young faces in the front row here and just a few rows behind you there's a, a few old faces that belong to a group of fellows who served in the SAS and they've <laughs> served at the other extreme if not both extremes of these temperatures. Amazing isn't it? A hundred degree range of temperature in which the human frame can work. We adopted Inuk methods of travel by dog sled. The Comatic, or sled, lashed with rawhide became our flexible platform. The Kingmech, the phenomenal husky, our powerhouse. But whereas the Inuit, a coastal people, remained close to land, we were poised to venture far out of sight of land upon a vast expanse of sea ice. In place of the painstakingly slow process of hunting, the currency for our venture depended upon fundraising and logistic support. In place of the bow and arrow and harpoon, we carried a rifle for protection against Nanook. In place of food insecurity, with its dependence upon the availability of raw meat, we carried 5,000 calories a day, vitamin-enriched, dehydrated medical research council sledging rations and learn to accept that everything acquires a distinct taste with dog hair in it. In place of the windblown ripples of Sastrugi and iconic Inukshuks, we called upon the, a different kind of navigational literacy, using theodolite, radio, chronometer, magnetic compass and navigation tables, and maintaining contemporaneous log of time and place and direction and distance correcting for drift at each opportunity. In place of the labor-intensive Aput Igloo, or snow house, we pitch tents in a matter of minutes. The Inuit travel in strongly established traditional family groups. They belong to each other. By contrast, our track reflected a small, temporarily uprooted all-male sample from an arguably less cohesive societal culture in which individualism intended to procure advancement within a societal setting. Or as Shakespeare would put it, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. <coughs> Omitted, all the, life of the, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows. Well, that's his opinion. The next slide, please. Sledging calls for strenuous physical exertion, and this is beautifully summed up by the words of Mark Twain, I'm glad I did it, partly because it was well worth it, but chiefly because I shall never have to do it again. <laughs> Next slide. How to cross open water. You don a wetsuit, you tie a rope around your tummy, and you swim to the other side, making fast the rope while your friends your colleagues wrap a sled in a tarpaulin and convert it into an ungainly barge. The next slide, please. And this you operate by employing Murphy's Law, which of course means if anything can go wrong, it will. When fog closed in, visual cues would blend into the featureless backdrop of a whiteout. We became disoriented in a silent and chill gray void of sensory deprivation as we depended upon our compass and our dogs. Constant directional checks offsetting for magnetic variation called for us to know not only our latitude but also how far east or west we were drifting, our longitude. The Inuit use a soapstone gullet to burn blubber with a wick. Our stoves were using vaporized kerosene, or paraffin, under pressure, giving off five times more heat than the same, for the same volume of fluid. Then in 1933, which was just two years before I arrived on this globe, two years before I was born, the manufacturing process for synthetic vitamin C was discovered, allowing for the first time its incorporation into rations and the prevention of scurvy. I must acknowledge the 
dedication, skill and tenacity of those providing logistic and communication support. Squadron Leader Freddie Church provided our radio relay, shifting his location to optimize radio propagation as we crossed further and further away from his initial location. We used a total of seven extreme range parachute drops by 435 Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force. This is a chart of the logistic support we received in the top right hand corner there in the white arrows the US Naval Arctic Research Laboratory at Point Barrow were providing our initial supplies and then the uh, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force picking up our pre-placed supplies in Resolute and at the US Air Force Base in Thule in Northwest Greenland and then finally we were picked up by the Royal Navy HMS Endurance coming up from uh, the United Kingdom. What stopped us in the summer was the melting snow forming freshwater melt pools, icy cold, uh, your feet were constantly wet, and the dogs would battle through that bravely, but that is what stopped us. The polar bear is the world's largest terrestrial carnivore at the top of the food chain in this sea ice habitat. Many spend their entire lives on the ice, with a silent footfall, this stealthy predator, approaching from downwind out of a sea mist, is capable of sudden bursts of speed reaching 40 kilometers an hour. Thanks to the World Wildlife Federation for this uh, chart, it shows the scattered circumpolar populations of polar bears, which are estimated to be about 25,000. The cubs remaining with their mothers for three years. Our first encounter with a bear was at the pole of relative inaccessibility, the furthest point in any direction from land. Trichinosis, an intestinal parasite whose larvae encapsulate, encapsulates in muscle, including heart muscle, is something to worry about when you're eating polar bear meat. Make sure you cook it thoroughly. In addition to that, the toxic concentrations found in polar bear liver Toxic concentrations of vitamin A uh, are sufficient to cause cerebral edema, swelling of the brain, which will also kill you. And altogether, we sustained 11 encounters with predatory polar bears. We would now attempt at the end of the summer to place ourselves into the transpolar drift stream. At that point, Gill fell sustaining an incapacitating back injury. We lost our mobility and that exposed us to the danger of moving ice. In this slide you can see me lashing Alan in a sleeping bag onto my sled with my dog team looking back and wondering what the strange load is and can they eat it? And if they can't eat it, can they piddle on it? We had to retreat to the large multi-year ice flow which had been our sanctuary for the past summer months. We had however now lost an entire sledging season before the winter was upon us. We lost a chance to benefit from a winter drift in the transpolar drift stream. We called in 435 Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force to deliver 70 pallets of parachuted supplies from C-130 Hercules aircraft and we gave up any prospect of rescue during the coming five months of winter in the high Arctic. We were now to spend five months without sunlight from October to February, living in a five square meter insulated tent on a raised wooden floor. The flow split 70, meter, 70 meters from our campsite, necessitating the relocation of our accommodation and 28 of tons of stores by the light of hurricane lamps, and that took us a month. The dogs thrived unprotected from the elements. And during that five months, Gill made an uneventful recovery uh, and was able to sledge again. Then the flow split a second time, this time just four meters from the winter quarters, and you can see that split right across 
the, the, the photograph there, just four meters from our tent. But we, were, we had escaped. The temperature minus 50 degrees Celsius. Visibility was poor in the twilight of late winter and the ice was moving. But remember, mobility was our best guarantee of survival. And yet we'd reached only halfway after one year on the ice. The average temperature for the next six weeks was 40 degrees below zero. Wind speeds at times reached 40 knots. And the ice formation reduced effectiveness of sleeping bags in extreme cold. What happens is, you see, you've got this lovely thick sleeping bag and your body vapor migrates through the lovely thick insulating layers and it hits freezing point before it reaches the outside. So over a period of days you get ice forming within the insulation material of the sleeping bag. So after two or three weeks it becomes far less effective. And that had debilitating consequences with sleep deprivation and hypothermia. On April the 6th of 1969, we reached the North Pole. We'd not been driven by an obsession to get there first, because at the time it was our unquestioned understanding that Peary had claimed to have reached this point on the exact day 60 years earlier, in 1909. For us, it was a welcome uh, it was welcomed as a unique navigational waypoint on a longer journey. We had been traveling north following the international dateline until we reached the North Pole. Now, without changing direction, we would be altering course, heading south following the prime meridian. We had arrived at a navigational anomaly where the conventions of time and space meet. In a fundamental way, this axis of the turning world, set as it is at an angle of 23 and a half degrees from the plane of its elliptical path around the sun, provides the mechanism by which we experience the cyclical nature of day and night and the four seasons of the world and their impact upon the provenance of the biosphere in which we live and move. Simply put, without the North Pole being where it is, life as we know it would not exist and we wouldn't be here at all. This is where you were shoved off course by the Coriolis effect, a strange consequence of a rotational frame of reference affecting untethered objects like ice flows, experienced maximally the axis of rotation. Here you have 24 hours of daylight or darkness, and here at 90 degrees north, of course every direction points south, there's no east or west, no longitude or time zones, so you don't know what time it is. Here the prime meridian meets the international date line, so you actually don't know what day it is. Here you are as far from the equator as it's possible to go. And it is from here that the meter was first theoretically conceived as one ten thousandth of the distance between the North Pole and the equator measured on the great circle passing through the northernmost town in France, Dunkirk. Soon after the completion of our trek, we were invited to lunch with members of the expedition committee at the Athenaeum Club, a club whose membership role lists 52 Nobel laureates, both male and female. This was no old boys club, no echo chamber for a self-conscious conformity but a forum for great ideas, ideas which would inspire. Lord John Hunt, who 16 years earlier, on the 29th of May of 1953, had led the first successful ascent of Mount Everest, leaned toward me at the, as the momentum of the conversation drifted to the far end of the long dining room table, and quietly confided with an eloquence befitting the ambience of our circumstances. I too, subscribe to the Christian ethic. During my teenage years, Colonel John Hunt had become legendary. He was a national hero, and now my senior by half a lifetime. He had graciously reached out to bear witness 
with decisive clarity to his own organizing principle, confirming nothing less than a steadfast conviction of life-shaping life significance. It was an astonishing and indeed encouraging courtesy, a recognition between a peer of the realm who had been instrumental in being the first to reach the highest point on earth above mean sea level, and a young army officer who just months earlier had passed through the lowest point on earth, the geographic North Pole, the point by virtue of the earth's shape as an oblate spheroid, which is closest to its center. It was those extremes of geophysical elevation that momentarily attracted our mutual interest. And the rugged allusion to the fact that neither of us had not exactly been wearing carpet slippers on the occasion of our adventurous pursuits. This is the oldest map of the world. It's a single piece of parchment measuring about six feet across in its own air-conditioned room in Hereford Cathedral in England. Jerusalem is at the center of the three known continents. And the orientation is of east at the top of the map. It is, in fact, a pictorial encyclopedia of the then known world with explanatory notes in Latin. There's no North Pole, of course, but inscribed in Norman French, the vernacular language of the aristocracy, there is a challenge. Pass avant. Go for it. Well, we told the dogs that it was all downhill from here on, and they were happy lads. Our first sighting of land as we clambered on to get another pressure ridge uh, was 60 months after we first set out from Alaska. On the 29th of May, 1969, overcast skies obscured a full moon whose gravitational pull now reinforced prevailing ocean currents with strong spring tides. The increasingly unstable ice field was forced against the lee shore onto the granite cliffs of Vesley Tavloya, Little Table Island. 29th of May 1969 also happened to be the 50th anniversary of the observation of the same moon from the island of Principe in the Bight of West Africa as it, it eclipsed the sun. At that moment, starlight from Hyades in the constellation Taurus was observed to be deflected by 1.6 seconds of arc, by the gravitational pull of the sun. This had been predicted by Einstein's 1916 theory of general relativity. And it was this confirmation which propelled him to celebrity status along a path that would soon return to Ferdinand Magellan's Mariana Islands. But this time, a different vessel, not Magellan's Trinidad, but Colonel Paul Tibbetts, Enola Gay. The next 11 days, we attempted to close with HMS Endurance and were finally extricated by helicopter. Endurance, this is traction, over. Endurance, send, over. At 1900 hours, GMT, 29 May, 1969, a landing was made by Alan Gill and Major Ken Hedge is on a small rocky island at 80 degrees 49 minutes north, 20 degrees 23 minutes east, after a scramble across three quarters of a mile of unstable ice and gyrating ice pans. This landing, though brief, concludes the first crossing of the surface of the Arctic Ocean. Incredibly, Gill and I had scrambled ashore on this desolate island within two or three cable lengths of the coordinates recorded by HMS Carcass and Midshipman Horatio Nelson 169 years earlier. And now it would be my humble duty to signal the Ministry of Defense, relayed by the good officers of the Lords of the Admiralty. Nelson had come from the south. We had arrived from the north. Now using Nelson's coordinates, all I had to do was simply change the date. That's the end, of the, the end of the slide, thank you. Now, I want to say a few words, if I may, if time allows. Does time allow? 
I thought he was clapping, you know. <laughs> Time allows. A long expedition not only probes into the unknown, it also attenuates normal contact with society. It becomes an exercise in social deprivation. There is, of course, almost no personal space. Oh, shucks, it's not worth it. There are no societal reference points, no conventional, no conventions, no institutions, and incredibly beyond territorial waters, I would submit, no prevailing laws. The way ahead becomes an exercise in trust. You consciously entrust your life to others. You subconsciously entrust your sanity to your capacity for self-composure under stress. And in the end, and if you survive, you may be called upon to present a credible account in response to a question of what it is that sustains you. And this is different for different people. We had accepted calculated risks predicated on and encouraged by the historic momentum of polar exploration. Depending for our survival upon ourselves, our dogs, and the successful implementation of our logistic plan. We traveled before the days of global positioning systems, satellite communications, and personal computers, and without the benefit of weather or ice forecasting, in a world where for most days uh, we would be under an overcast sky and celestial navigation would be the uncomfortable bedfellow of dead reckoning. Our path was not straight. We navigated a labyrinth carved through moving sea ice by the forces of climate, season, and prevailing weather patterns. It was an erratic traverse, destined to become the longest recorded dog sled journey on sea ice in the history of polar exploration in both distance, 6,000 kilometers, and duration, 476 days, the estimated duration of a round trip to Mars and back. As a matter of fact, when I gave a presentation to 435 Squadron in Winnipeg two or three years ago, at the end of the presentation, two ladies came up to me. One was dressed as a major in the uniform of the Royal Canadian Air Force and one was in civvies. And these two ladies came up to me and they said, we're psychiatrists, we'd like to talk to you. And they went on to explain that they worked for the Canadian Space Agency. And it was their task to select people to float around in space. And once they were floating around in space, to, top, to stop them fighting each other. We reached in return from the North Pole, but in doing so, became unwittingly embroiled in a distasteful conflict with earlier uncorroborated claims as to who got there and back first. We'd undertaken the first, indeed, the only manual measurements of sea ice thickness across the Arctic Ocean, and in doing so, had recorded a sequential baseline, marking the beginning of ominous changes as we crossed the threshold of an unseen shift in climate. Soon enough, within our own lifespan, we might expect to see the consequences. We had completed the first crossing of the surface of the Arctic Ocean. We left footsteps in the snow where none had gone before, but our tracks would soon thaw, recycled in the economy of nature to leave no attestation of our passing. Yet only life can spawn a conscious sense of awareness, and the testimony of our adventure came not from the inanimate and remote eyescape, but from the insights and reflections of an experience in which we felt privileged to have taken part. On that last day, as we waited for our extrication by helicopter, something stirred in the isotherms of an unseen world beneath the ice. In those unrehearsed moments, as each, as each of us was engaged with our own thoughts, I rested my head on the sheepskin which had served as a mattress for the past 476 days. Almost imperceptibly, I became aware of a melodic whistling conducted through the ice. The immense silence of the Arctic was transmuted into the pristine farewell song of a whale pod, as if confirming a universe that did not come into the existence by accident, any more than our own lives and what we do and how we live are destined to be bereft of significance. It's been said that life is not more complicated than we think. It's more complicated than we can think. If I was to learn anything, 
It is that there is no prerequisite to disregard the prospect of creation as we travel the span of one brief and unrepeatable lifetime. If any journey is to be worthwhile, it must embrace a personal validity. For there is within us, and I believe this to be self-evident, an innate yet vulnerable faculty that seeks an accountable purpose to life. This is the human spirit, a vessel of discovery for the meaning of life and how we should live it. If I have a story to tell, it's the tale of a journey described by the late Canadian author Farley Mowat as an epic and perhaps the last of its kind, in which we trod the pathway of common experience in company with the folklore of the Inuit, the exploits of seafarers and polar explorers spanning four centuries, and the outstanding service of those who had provided our lifeline. And if there is something to report, it is of the faculty of the human spirit, characterized by the courage to hold fast in the presence of uncertainty. These were and remain hard lessons, harvested more by our failures than our successes, and are best captured for me in the refrain of an 18th century seafarer, who in March of 1748 barely survived a North Atlantic gale, not unlike the gale with which this presentation began, uh, which drove those Vikings to the New World. John Newton, a slave trader, records that when driven to despair by those ferocious seas, he reached for the Bible which his mother had given him, and there he read from 1 Chronicles chapter 17, if you're interested, Who am I, O Lord God, that you have brought me safe thus far? Later Newman's, uh, Newton's life would echo those words as he composed, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. The stanzas were later set to the hauntingly soulful melody, arising from the oral tradition of African slaves manacled, below deck. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been most gracious, and that concludes my reflections of a rather long camping holiday. Thank you for the very real privilege of allowing me to share the story with you. Do I have any questions? I don't have any questions. Maybe the audience too. Oh, okay. <laughs> questions, anybody? Yes, sir. Um, when we were extracted uh, by helicopter to HMS at Endurance, um, what became of the dogs? They were extracted by the same method. Oh, good. And they were, they were lovingly cared for by the sailors, as you can imagine. Um, uh, you got used to um, being with the dogs. You could kind of read their body language. And I, and I was pretty good at knowing when they were going to all howl at the same time. And one day I was up on the bridge as we were sailing back to Portsmouth. And the dogs were uh, all tethered down on the foredeck. And the sailors were all playing with them and enjoying their company. And I just had a sense that the dogs were getting a little bit agitated. And were all going to howl at the same time. Forty huskies all howling at the same time. Magnificent sound. So I went down from the bridge, down to the, to the foredeck, and stood amongst the huskies, and raised my head into the air and started howling. And the sailors looked at me, and the dogs looked at me, and nothing happened. <laughs> but the dogs, yeah, the dogs uh, came home, and uh, they had a, a very happy uh, time. Half of them were incorporated into the Norwegian Mountain Rescue Team. Thank you. Yes, sir. You say that you, four of you, the number was dictated by what you could carry. It was sort of uh, the, the minimum you could get by with and didn't more. I'm interested that you didn't use the Inuit at all. Uh, now, although they are used to traveling across that kind of distance, but was that, in fact, a fully controlled? In fact, you couldn't have taken five or three. Uh, the four was the control that very much the governor who went with you? Um, it's a, a combination. 
Alan's, Alan's gone, has he? Um, uh, um, Alan, the, the, question, the question that I'm going to bounce on you, Alan Bell, <laughs> is, <laughs> is um, um, we had, our party consisted of four people, which was the optimum number consistent with being able to help each other if things got tough. And your question is, could we have been less than four, or could we have been more than four? And if we could have been more than four, could we have accommodated bringing along uh, an Inuit, perhaps, or something like that? Uh, how rigid was four? I, I'd like to ask Alan's impression that it seems to me that in those kind of circumstances, that four is probably a minimum number that you want to be goofing around with. And, and, and less than that, you're you're running into a problem with self-help. Um, I know it's almost fashionable these days to go on solo expeditions. And I'm opposed to that because it's introducing an element of avoidable risk. I see no point in doing that. But Alan, if you have anything to say, I'd be most grateful if you could get me off the hook. <laughs> the, uh, the optimum SES patrol was four men. The reason why there was four men in an SES patrol was simply because one was a radio operator, one was a medic, and one, uh, and one was a radio, a radio operator, a medic, a demolitionist, and the guy that actually run the four-man patrol. We found that with four men, all the things we would encounter when we were out on operations would be dealt with by one of those four men. And that's how we came to the four-man conclusion. Anything more than five, four was great, if you had the ability to be able to include another person. And contrary to popular belief about if someone gets injured and we leave him behind, that never happened either. But the most important thing was the mission. We had the three people, if there was one person left behind, the three piece, people had to uh, complete their mission, then they came back and dealt with the injured or wounded individual and then get him out of there. But the mission was the most important thing. So that's where the four people came from. And the Americans followed that later, when they started their special forces. Uh, the foreman was the optimum amount of people to be able to complete any task from blowing up a shipyard, blowing up a dam, blowing up an airfield. That was the maximum amount of people. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Yes. So there's something about four, I think, that that's a good guideline to go in. Now, if if our expedition manpower-wise had grown much larger than that it would tend to slow down the rate of progress. So four was a quick movie, uh, highly mobile, and there were enough of you uh, to help each other if somebody fell through the ice, for example. I had just seen a, a production about the Iditarod, and they had 14 dogs per sled. Of course, they went straight ahead rather than yours fanning out what was the reason for that number? Or did you start with more dogs? Because I know the dogs were your means of really making some time. Thank you, yes. Um, I, I was talking to an Iditarod uh, competitor not long ago, uh, Peter de la Billia's son, uh, Edward de la Billia, uh, ran in the Iditarod. And they used the, the tandem system, where you have a lead dog, uh, which is very receptive to shouted words of command left or right. And the other dogs are running tandem behind, often a her, and goodness knows why, they may be more intelligent or something, but it's often a female lead dog, and, and then the, the other dogs are in tandem behind. And the great advantage of the tandem system is that you can weave through trees. Now, if you try and do that with a fan system, where we are dogs are picking their own route, you're going to get stopped by the first tree in the wood as half the dogs are let to go one way and half the other half tend to go the other way. Um, the, there has to be a, our legs were pretty heavy and we needed a high number of dogs, 10, ten dogs is quite a big team and we needed that many to, to be able to pull the loads that they were pulling and to be able to pull them all day long, every day. Um, uh, but to have gone to bigger teams uh, would have meant that we had to increase the load in terms of dog food, which is our single heaviest item that we carried on the sled. So it was, it was logistic balancing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
might you be able to expand, sir, on some of the medical care that you had to give during the expedition? Yes, sir. I can't. I can't interpret your badge from this distance. No, no place. RCMI. Oh, no wonder I couldn't interpret. <laughs> So can I elaborate on some of the medical conditions? Well, time doesn't allow too much. I do remember that hemorrhoids was a bit of a nuisance. We used to refer to that as rock bottom. And, and uh, we found a very good cure was, was just uh, hygiene using a handful of snow. Uh, that served the purpose very well. Um, I had alluded to snow blindness and cataract formation. Uh, hypothermia was a real risk. We we nearly lost one guy who was quite disoriented and nearly suffocated uh, as he was trying to take off his heavy uh, wolfskin parka. Um, the, you lash them around the waist and with a rope and then you shove the uh, rope down so it jams against your hip and you have to take off the rope before you remove the parka. He didn't do that and he got stuck uh, inside his parka and was really struggling. And if there hadn't been somebody else close on hand, he would have suffocated. Uh, so hypothermia is, is, um, is a real hazard. It creeps up on you almost, well, certainly surreptitiously. And, uh, and it, it can cause all sorts of mischief. Um, and uh, it, it can be lethal. So it's something to prevent. Um, we, I don't think there are... Um, we had any, and uh, I filled a few teeth uh, with temporary fillings, the emphasis being on temporary because my attempts at filling them didn't last very long. Um, and uh, uh, I think that was it really. But what was really the problem, of course, was Alan Gill's back injury. Uh, that, that was a real showstopper. Thank you. What was the nature of his back injury? I don't know, they never told me. <laughs> they, they be me. I, I, you know, you, you, you have no, uh, your only mechanism for making a differential diagnosis, that is a short list of possibilities, was that medical, uh, your medical history, t talking to the patient and uh, assessing the intensity of his pain. He was a tough, wiry little Yorkshireman and wouldn't admit to pain if it hadn't been real. And then the clinical examination to see if there was any neurological uh, damage as well that was minimal, but it, it was uh, uh, it, it remained undiagnosed, and that's always a, a, a problem in an isolated area. You, you're falling short of a diagnosis, so you're you're having to treat the presenting constellation of symptoms. And to call that anything other than mechanical back pain, I think, would have been uh, uh, academically arrogant to do so. Um, he might have fractured something in his back. He might have sustained a slip disc. Uh, he might have just pulled his muscles, but he took a long, long time to get better. And uh, we, fortunately, at that time, we had a long, long time, of five months of the winter. And he was fine at the end. But it was a big, major problem. When I was um, uh, working up in Rankin Inlet, um, the, um, uh, the problem we ran into there was the children down in Aviat, which used to be called Eskimo Point, uh, getting, um, getting croup, little Inuit kids getting croup. And we would have to fly them out from Aviat up to Rankin Inlet and then down to Winnipeg. Because if we didn't, some of those, not all of them, but some of those kids would die. Um, most of them would survive, but some would not. And so we had to have um, a blanket rule that if, if a child has croup, you spend $5,000 flying that child to Winnipeg to be on the safe side. So you tend to have to in isolation, you, ha you, you tend to have to treat things in, in that manner. And it's, it's a really difficult call because if you happen to have a doctor with me, with you, uh, the doctor is at best giving medical advice to the expedition leader. And it's up to the expedition leader 
uh, to um, uh, make the best call he can uh, in our situation to save life. And um, uh, in a military situation, it, it might be somewhat different. You have to accept, uh, you have to accept uh, casualty losses as being the norm of combat. But in a civilian expedition, that's not acceptable. I don't know whether I answered your question at all, I just talked around it. We carried very little in terms of changes of clothing. Um, I carried a spare of everything uh, and, and found I was giving it away to my companions, one of whom burnt most of his clothing when the tank caught fire. Uh, so so we, we carried a minimum. Uh, we could, at a pinch, call for our next parachute drop, whenever that was, a month away or five months away, and uh, ask for replacements at that time. Uh, but we carried very little in the way of uh, spare clothing. So over that period of time, how many parachute drops did you actually have? Seven. Seven? Seven parachute drops, over 16 months, yes. And how many of you had Arctic preparation? Oh, my three companions were all experienced Arctic, or Antarctic. Um, uh, uh, they worked with the British Antarctic Survey, not all together, but at different times. So they had all lived in the Antarctic in the south uh, winter, uh, and they were well used to dog travel and that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think you can, you can accommodate, I mean, everyone is new at some point in time when they start. Each one of us is starting new at some point in our lives. And you can accommodate a greenhorn if you're not outnumbered by greenhorns. If, if you've got a, a sufficient experienced people there that can pass on uh, that knowledge, you can accommodate a newcomer who doesn't have that experience but may have other skills. You mentioned the polar bears uh, being right at the most distant point from land, and I think you mentioned foxes as a, a risk. Was there any other wildlife or bird life uh, that you saw uh, during the most distant Okay. No, it, it's a real desert, and uh, there's very little wildlife, and uh, polar bears certainly do roam right across uh, the Arctic Ocean, or they used to be able to do that, they can't now, of course. Um, we came across a lot of bird life right at the end of the expedition, when we approached the shore, and there was a, it was a that cliff was a, it must have been a honeymoon season for, for, for seabirds, it, it was very noisy and uh, lots of sea life, uh, seabird life there. But it, it was, an, it was a, an uncanny screeching <laughs> and, uh, and we were quite glad to work our way <laughs> clear of it. Any more? Oh. Uh, what happened to the other three members of the expedition? Um, they in fact were all dead, so I can tell all sorts of lies now. <laughs> Uh, um, Wally Herbert, the leader, discovered years, ten years after the expedition, that he had a wonderful artist's eye for painting. And he produced some of the most, to my mind, the most dramatic Arctic paintings that I've ever seen. Unfortunately, not long after that, he developed diabetes and his sight got so bad that he was unable to to continue that, um, and uh, it was diabetes that took, that took his life eventually. Um, 
Uh, Fritz Kerner, the glaciologist, continued to work in the Arctic up in with the uh, on uh, Devon Island, actually, which is north of Baffin Island, and um, uh, he developed some problems, which turned out to be uh, cancer, and he died. And uh, Alan Gill, the navigator, um, uh, developed a, a major stroke, was immobilized and couldn't talk, and, and spent the next five, last five years of his life, very sadly, living in a nursing home. Uh, it was very sad to see a person who had been so active early in his life, to know that that's how he would pass away. So I guess I'm next. I haven't decided which way I'm going to Further to that, uh, you looking at the description, your breadth of background is pretty outstanding. You have the SAS, you have a medical degree, uh, you've done sailing at sea and so on. Did the other three have that breadth of experience or did they tend to be narrow uh, or narrower in, in their background quality? Yours, you look like the average accountant or something like that, in other words, but you have a tremendous background that each thing would contribute to what you had to do walking for a year, couple of years across the ice. Were the others the same in the breadth of experience they brought to it? The, the other three, by virtue of the nature of their professional backgrounds, uh, drifted into uh, a cold weather environment. Wally Herbert had been trained uh, um, uh, in the military uh, to, uh, to use a theodolite uh, in the Royal Engineers, and, uh, and he went on to go to the uh, Antarctic and just thrived down there and loved it and spent his time down there. So it was a narrowly focused, professionally focused life. Same with Fritz Kerner. He, he uh, took a, a PhD in glaciology from Sheffield University, uh, at which point he found himself unemployable. So, so he went down to the Antarctic and he, he stayed there too. Alan Gill was not a professional background at all, but a fantastic odd job man. A good, a good fellow to have around. He, he was terrible at breaking things, but he was very, very good at fixing them. And, and, uh, and as for me, I, you know, I can't hold down a regular job. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for a journey back in time to danger and high adventure 50 years ago. And Purusha, thank you very much. An outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.